All right, here we go. Uh, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew for Beginners, lesson number two, title of this lesson, The New Testament Canon. The New Testament Canon. So let's, uh, let's review a little bit of lesson one, which was about the times and the society that Jesus lived in, very, very briefly here to kind of set the stage, because some of you weren't in this class when we first started. So Jesus was born during the uh, dominant uh, period of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled at the time that Jesus uh, was born. Palestine is under the control of the Romans. Um, politically, it's ruled by a Roman appointee who is uh, King Herod, uh, maintained by the Roman military under Pilate, and led in their day-to-day -day affairs by the wealthy Sadducee priests and their main teachers, the Pharisees. Uh, the country at this time is a hotbed of political and social turmoil, and it is straining at the leash of century, centuries of foreign domination and also, also stirred up by glorious expectations of a kind of a military political messiah that will free them from slavery and restore them to the golden era. They're thinking the golden era of Solomon when they were a world power, when things were great and they're anticipating this. So Jesus comes along, he's born in Bethlehem, he lives in Egypt for a while, he's raised in Nazareth by a poor couple. He grows up like other boys, learning a trade, learning how to read the law attending synagogue and on a yearly basis anyways, attending temple worship festivals and so on and so forth. We know that he enters public ministry at the age of 30, confronting the people, confronting the Pharisees, confronting the Sadducees, confronting the king, confronting the Roman leaders with the claim that he is the Messiah and he is the hope of Israel. And you have to think now, considering what they were expecting, no wonder they were surprised. No wonder they were surprised. It was like whiplash. <laughs> he was the last guy they thought was going to be the Messiah, but they couldn't deny the miracles. That was the problem. You know, that was the problem, the problem that they had. So he is hailed as king, he's killed as a criminal, and he's resurrected eventually to demonstrate his deity and his lordship. So there's in a nutshell, you know, uh, Matthew, and some of the things we talked about last week. So Matthew, one of his disciples, writes about his life and teachings and actions, and we have Matthew's account of these things in what is called the Gospel of Matthew. All right, so there's a little nutshell of what we did last time. So I want to talk about the New Testament canon today in this lesson. Because uh, before we actually talk about Matthew himself and how we got his book, I think we should talk a little bit about how and why the books of the New Testament, why were they put together in the first place? In the early church, the only written scripture used at first was the Jewish writings or the scriptures now referred to as the Old Testament. Right? The, apostled, the apostles, rather, use these to argue the deity of Jesus. These were the proof texts that uh, they used, in addition to their own, you know, in addition to their own teachings, their, uh, also in addition to their witness of the resurrection. But when they wanted to refer to scripture to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, they were referring to the Old Testament. For example, in uh, Acts uh, chapter, uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 14 and 15 and 16, uh, Peter, when he's preaching, begins, he says, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice. This is on the day of Pentecost. Jesus has risen from the dead. Forty days later, fifty days later, the, at the Feast of Pentecost, many, many thousands of people are in Jerusalem. Peter gets up, begins to preach. He says, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. And I neglected to mention that the Spirit of God had come over the apostles. They were speaking in tongues, speaking in different languages. The people were amazed. So uh, Peter is saying, you know, these men are not drunk. 
okay, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes Joel and he says, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So what does Peter do to prove that what is happening before these people is actually part of God's plan to bring the Messiah? Well, he says to them in Joel, Old Testament prophet, the prophet said, when the Messiah comes, you will know the Messiah has come because everyone will have the Spirit. Young people, old people, men, women, the poor, everyone will have the Spirit. So you ask yourself, well, what do you mean everyone will have the Spirit? Well, realize that in the Old Testament, not everybody had the Spirit. I mentioned this in our other class on Sunday. I mean, only a few people had the Spirit and only for a little amount of time. The prophets had the Spirit. You know, Isaiah said, the Spirit came upon me. Yeah, okay, and he, and he spoke. And even Saul, the king, for a moment, for a few times, the Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. And Samson, the Spirit came upon him and he did great things, and Samuel. So only certain people had the Spirit just for a time. So the promise of the Old Testament about the Messiah was that when the Messiah comes, everybody will have the Spirit. Everybody will have the Spirit, not just the kings, not just the prophets, not just the judges, everybody will have the Spirit. That's what Joel is talking about here. That's what Peter is referring to here when he's talking in Acts chapter two. These men are not drunk, he says. What you're seeing here is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy when Joel said, when the Messiah comes, Everybody will have the Spirit. And see, here are these 12 men. They've all got the Spirit. They're all talking in tongues and so on and so forth. All right? In 2 Timothy chapter, um, uh, he continues, you know, he continues to quote Joel, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and the earth below and so on and so forth. Anyways, the point I'm trying to make here is the proof text he uses to demonstrate what is going on is of God is back in the Old Testament. Why? Well, that's all they had. They just had you know, the Old Testament. The New Testament obviously wasn't written. Then in 2 Timothy 3.15, um, uh, Paul says a little bit later on, he says, and that from childhood, he's talking to Timothy here, a young evangelist, he says, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. What sacred writings? Well, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. That those were the only sacred writings available to the apostles when they began to preach. So Timothy came to know Christ and salvation, how? Well, he knew the Old Testament. Well, how did that help him? The Old Testament pointed him to who the Messiah was going to be and what to look for and what would happen when the Messiah came and so on and so forth. Okay? So with the spread of the gospel through the preaching and the miraculous works of the apostles, their own writings came to be as authoritative as the Old Testament scriptures, especially with churches that were made up of mainly, mainly Gentiles. Let's face it, the apostles were teaching, but they were also doing miracles. Would it seem you know, normal to you that the person who can raise somebody from the dead or someone that can heal someone miraculously, if they say what I'm saying to you comes from God, you can pretty much you know, believe that? So as the apostles uh, you know, ministered, as they traveled, as they preached, as they performed uh, miracles, their writings came to be accepted as inspired as of God. So the apostles themselves were aware of their responsibility to teach and to preserve for the church the words of Christ and the power that had been given to them in order to accomplish this. 
So in Matthew chapter 28, for example, uh, the apostles, or Jesus says to the apostles, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And in John chapter 14, 26, uh, Jesus says to the apostles, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And so the apostles understood, what, the point I'm trying to make here is that the apostles understood that they themselves were going to speak the words of Christ and what they were going to teach would become authoritative for the church. Okay? And we know this because they were, they were aware of this. You know, they, nobody had to tell them that, they understood that. So if we read, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, it says, uh, Paul here, it says, uh, he says to the church, yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages uh, to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which uh, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Keep on going, he says, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So what's Paul doing here? He's making the argument that what I'm saying to you is from God. We're not like the philosophers, we're not like the, you know, the orators that are circulating, you know, uh, simply repeating the wisdom of the age. We're here and what we're telling you, we've received this from God and we're giving it to you. So if someone ever asked you the question, did the apostles really understand that what they were saying was inspired? Yes. They knew that what they were saying was from God. I mean, you can't make it any clearer than what Paul uh, is saying it here. Uh, another, uh, so that's Paul saying that. Let's look at John. In Revelation chapter one, verses one and two, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. Well, who are the bondservants? Well, the apostles. And he sent and communicated it, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So there's John the apostle. What is he saying? You know, God has given to me He's shown me things which I have seen, which I now am giving to you. So was John aware that what he was writing was inspired? Uh, yes. Why? Because he saw it in a vision. Because he's spelling it out to his readers even. Okay. Uh, let's, do, uh, you know, let's do Peter, shall we? Second Peter chapter one. It says, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. What's he referring to? He's talking about the transfiguration. He's saying, we were with Jesus when He was transfigured. We heard God with our own ears. And he says, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. 
And then he says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So there we have Paul, we have John, and now we have Peter spelling out to their hearers what I'm saying to you has coming from God. What you are reading in your hands has authority. Let me just do one other one here. In 2 Peter, this is really a fascinating scripture, this one here. Remember, Paul talks about himself you know, and what he's seen and what he knows and it comes from God. And, 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 and John talks about himself. You know, he had the vision and what he's giving them in the book of Revelation. This is from God, right? And then Peter says, you know, what I'm giving you, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I heard God. I saw Jesus being transfigured. What I'm giving you, this is from God. But this is really interesting. Watch, in 2 Peter 3, 14, 15, Peter is saying, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in Him in peace and spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So here Peter is saying, when you're reading Paul's letters, I know they're complicated, but be careful. Don't let anybody twist them you know, out of shape or anything like, twist them to have other meanings like they do other scriptures. And he uses the big you know, scriptures, meaning what Paul was writing, Peter is saying to the church, what Paul is writing to you, this is inspired. And be careful that nobody twists Paul's words like they do the other scriptures. He's referring to the Old Testament. He's, he's saying to them, don't twist Paul's words like some people try to twist Isaiah's words or Jeremiah's words. So here, here you have one apostle confirming the authenticity and inspiration of another apostle. Okay? So I've taken a lot of time here because I really want to drive this point home. The apostles were aware themselves that what they were doing, what they were writing was inspired and they were also accepting one another's work as being inspired as well. All right, so for this reason, the apostolic writings and, uh, the, and those authorized by the apostles, for example, Mark, he wrote the Gospel of Mark, but Mark was not an apostle. Mark, you know, John Mark, Mark was the young man who ran away there uh, you know, on the, in the garden. He ran away and they tried to grab his, his, his clothes and you know, his, his cloak you know, stayed in the, in the guard's hands. You know, and Mark lived in Jerusalem, John Mark. Well, Mark eventually became the secretary for Peter. He would write, Peter would dictate, Mark would, would write. Okay? And so when you read the Gospel of Mark, what you're really reading is Peter. Peter is, is giving Mark that, that information. The point I'm making here is that Mark was not an apostle, but he was a disciple of a living apostle. Okay? So he, his writings also have authority by virtue of the fact that he was a part of the circle of the apostles. Now for many years, these writings circulated independently from church to church, from country to country. It wasn't felt that they should be collected into one book or one canon. I'll explain the term canon in a minute. But then a, a couple of things happened that forced them to uh, consider uh, gathering these inspired works and putting them together in, in one collection. So here are some of the things that happened. First of all, the apostles began to, uh, to die. And so the output and the ability to confirm the genuineness of writings that were circulating in the church began to be lost. You know, while they were alive, they could confirm personal authorship or, or they could 
authorize authorship. Okay? Um, that wasn't present anymore. So they couldn't say, oh, this is fake. This, I did not write this. Or they could not assign to someone, like to Mark, to write something. They were no longer there. They were the ones that made the decision about these things while they were alive. And so there needed to be something that would guard against the proliferation of fakes and forgeries because there was a lot of stuff circulating in those times. There were a lot of writing. A lot of people were writing about Jesus. A lot of people were writing about Christianity. A lot of people were writing about religion and the second coming you know, and so on and so forth. But at least while the apostles were alive, they could you know, kind of separate the good from the bad type thing. But as they began to die, the church was losing that ability. Secondly, uh, heresies began within the church, false teachings, false doctrine. Um, and these things needed to be addressed in every church with the full and the complete content of the teachings of Jesus and not just partial information scattered throughout the Roman Empire. So this church over here would have perhaps the letter of Paul to the Romans, Okay, but it wouldn't have his letter to the Galatians. And his Galatian letter was very important because it addressed the particular problem that the book of Romans didn't address, or, you know, or vice versa. You know. So there was, there was a, a need to have all the writing, each church wanted to have all the writing of the apostles so that they could have a complete, um, you know, a complete set of, of teaching. And then, um, I mean, there's more than this, but I'm giving you the big ones here. Uh, the Roman Empire itself attempted to destroy Christianity, and one method was to destroy the records of the teachings of Jesus, and so it became a capital offense to have in one's possession any of the books, any of the letters, actually, or the epistles. Uh, we know the book of Revelation is about you know, the, uh, the, the persecution that the church suffered at the hands of the Romans, written in a particular style where just the Christians would understand, but the, the Romans uh, wouldn't. Uh, it also helped them to decide which books to keep. If you've got 10 books, big books, and so on and so forth, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe I'll die, or I'll, you know, hopefully I would like to think I would. You know, I'll die to preserve you know, the inspired writings to save it and whatever, you know, but I'm not going to die for a fake. I'm not going to go to prison and torture for you know, a book that is not authentic. And so it helped whittle out which books people would keep all right, during the persecution. Now because there was no printing, or printing was really a, you know, an arduous task in those days, uh, and travel and communication was very, very slow. It took a lot of years, but with the eventual conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine, this task of, of assembling together all the authoritative books was completed. Um, Constantine ordered Eusebius, um, um, who is a bishop of Caesarea, and also uh, a church historian, uh, he commissioned him to produce 50 Bibles. 50, today, 50 Bibles. You know, a printing press could whip that out in a, you know, an hour or something. Yeah. 50 Bibles um, for preservation at the church in um, Constantinople. Uh, but in those days, 50 Bibles, you know, once the, everything was collected, to, to do 50 Bibles was a, a long-term project and extremely expensive, something that really only a king could pay for. Okay? Um, so Eusebius uh, gathered together uh, these books that had been universally accepted by the early church as authentic apostolic writings, and he brought them together into one text, and the 27 books of the New Testament canon, the word canon comes from another word, cane or cane, which is a rod, a rod of measurement. So it's the books that measure up, you know, how you measure something, okay, quality control, so the canon means the books that measure up, if you wish, New Testament canon. And they had a criteria, which books come in and which books do not. First one uh, was the books under consideration had to be written by or under the direction of an apostle. If, if, if the book did not meet that particular specification, it had no chance to 
come into the canon. Secondly, uh, it had to be well circulated within the church during their lifetime, meaning during the lifetime of the apostles. It couldn't be some obscure little book that nobody ever heard of. It had to be something, you know, somebody says, well, what about the book of Romans? You know, Paul's letter to the Romans. Well, the church leaders in those days would say, oh yeah, everybody knows that book. You know, it's been around for 100 years, you know, and so on and so forth, and, and, and it's been confirmed by leaders in, in, in all the cities and so on and so forth. So it had to be a book that was well circulated, well known, well thought of, already considered as part of uh, the apostles' writing at the time. And then the third consideration, it had to be uh, accepted by the church in the apostolic age. In other words, the apostolic church must have accepted it for it to make it into the, uh, into the canon. So this effort began around 330 um, AD and uh, it was confirmed by all the churches, you know, this 27 book canon was confirmed by all the churches by the year 397, 397 AD. The 27 books were finally confirmed, collected and confirmed. So uh, for almost 1600 years, we've had exactly the same 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, some people say, wow, 400 years, that's a whole long time. But in those days, it would take decades and decades to get things you know, done and, and uh, moving along. So there's a little idea, just a little bit of background on how the New Testament canon was collected. All right? So let's talk about Matthew more specifically. So Matthew was one of Jesus' chosen apostles. He was a tax collector who left his profitable but repugnant business in order to follow Jesus. Um, he wouldn't be the type of man you know, that I would choose. If I was going around to choose men you know, to be my disciples, this is not one of the guys that I would have got. You know, I would have gone to the temple, maybe found a scribe or you know, somebody that knew the, the Bible well or a priest or something like that. Not, not a tax collector you know, who was hated by, you know, by Jews. Um, Matthew's book circulated with the title, originally it was According to Matthew and was universally accepted as an apostolic text as early as 125 AD. So by, by the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, it was already accepted by, by the church. Uh, one of the earliest recorded church historians, Papias, who was a disciple of John the Apostle, Papias writes in his book that Matthew originally wrote a Hebrew or an Aramaic text which recorded Jesus' ministry and sayings, the Logia. Uh, and Papias says that this was written somewhere between 65 and 69 um, AD. And there's a reason why they say that Matthew's book was written between 65 and 69, and that's because in 70 AD, the Romans came, completely destroyed the temple, Jerusalem, killed everybody, brought slaves, you know, totally destroyed the city. Well, had that happened you know, uh, in Matthew's time, you know, it would seem that Matthew would have mentioned that in his, in his gospel. Matthew mentions Jesus talking about what will happen one day, you know, that, that this will happen, but he doesn't talk at all about it being something that has already happened. So this is why scholars believe he wrote a his gospel before 70 AD. 65 is usually the, the year where it's, uh, it's penned. Uh, the original text, the original written document that he wrote is lost, was lost, but what we have is a Greek translation uh, which is what circulated in the second century. So 100 to 200 AD uh, is the Greek copy of that. Although the original Hebrew text was lost or destroyed, there were a lot of reports from the early first and second century writers who claimed to have seen and used it and they did not deny the accuracy of the Greek translation which was circulating at the time. So we have some names here. Irenaeus um, says that the authorship was in 64 AD. 
Pentanius, uh, who lived in 170 AD, says that he found an actual heap in his writings, these are all his church historians, he says that in his writings he, he found a copy, the he, a Hebrew copy of the gospel in India. And then Origen, 220 AD, wrote, uh, said that, um, that Matthew's uh, gospel was written in, um, in Hebrew for the Jews. Now some scholars believe that in addition to the Aramaic one, Matthew also produced one in the Greek language, but with a kind of a Jewish style. So it's in this way that scholars determine the legitimacy of this book uh, as of apostolic authorship and put it into the canon. It circulated, it was by one of his apostles, it was accepted by the church, and then there was lots of historical writing to confirm the fact that this book actually existed at the time, was used by the church, and so on and so forth. I've given you a lot here about how the book came to be, but when you're studying the Bible, okay, uh, a lot of times there's a whole lot of information that comes before you actually open the book itself, before you even begin to study Mark or John or Romans or something. There's a whole background of information as to when it was written, who wrote it, why, all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm packing all that into this lesson here tonight. Okay? All right, the purpose and the structure, interesting. The purpose of his book, uh, it's a defense or an apologetic work directed at the Jews. As we read through Matthew, you'll see that Matthew is very careful to explain the difficulties for the Jewish mind. The, the virgin birth, for example, he, he gives background to that. Uh, the death on the cross, you know, that, that would be a problem for a Jew because you know, cursed is the man who you know, uh, is on a tree, who dies on a tree. You know, whoa, Jesus died on a tree, he died on, a, on the cross. Uh, the, the issue of Sabbath, the issue of bribing the guards to lie, uh, the procedures with the Sanhedrin and so on and so forth. So Matthew you know, is careful to really explain these things. Uh, a Gentile mind wouldn't care about the Sanhedrin, you know, wouldn't care about that, but a Jewish person would, would care a lot uh, about that. Uh, he has a sense of history and Jewish custom. He puts in a, a, the, the uh, genealogy of Jesus. Again, for a, for a Gentile, would have no interest in the genealogy, but a Jew would, because a Jew would want to know, well, wait a minute, what this, if this guy's the Messiah, what tribe does he come from? And if he comes from the tribe of Judah, well, spell it out for me. Well, who's his dad and who's his grandfather and, who's, and so on and so forth. Matthew takes the time to provide that information for his uh, Jewish, um, Jewish leaders. And also the fulfillment of prophecy. If you read through Matthew, you're going to see he's always saying, uh, and he did this, you know, as it is said in, as it is written, you know, or to fulfill the prophecy. Again, uh, a Gentile wouldn't care about that, but a Jew would. A Jew would be very interested to see how is Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies about him? Matthew is very careful to lay all that out. So uh, it's a defense and a, an apologetic work for Jews. It's also a manual for young Christians. Uh, it is a very orderly arrangement of sayings and ministry of Jesus. I'm going to give you another sheet tonight. You're going to see how structured this gospel is. So uh, uh, the book could be used to convert either a Jew or a Gentile because it contained information that both of them could relate to and grow with, but the thrust of the material was really at the Jews. If you were a Gentile um, uh, in the first century and you had a choice of which gospel to use, probably use Mark because Mark is like, he went here, he did this, this miracle, then he went there, did that miracle, he went here, did this miracle, you know, this would really resonate with a, with a Gentile. Um, let's see, let's look at the uh, structure. The structure, there are six narratives. A narrative is an orderly description of events. He did this, he went here, he went there, he said this, he said that, he met that person, they went over here, they crossed the river, and so on and so forth, that's a narrative. A discourse is a conversation. He said to this person, this person said to him. You know, it's a dialogue or monologue. 
So there are six narratives, five discourses. Um, and each of them end with the words, now when Jesus had finished saying these things, and then it goes on to the next. Okay, so now you've got your, I've given you your study sheets, and the study sheets you'll notice, if you follow along with me, uh, you have a narrative, and at the top it says, you know, one colon one, that means chapter one, verse one to four, chapter four, verse 23. So, there is a narrative that begins in chapter one and goes all the way to chapter four, verse 23. And that's the beginnings of the gospel. And then that narrative is followed by a discourse that begins in chapter five, verse one, and goes to chapter seven, verse 29, Sermon on the Mount. And that discourse is then followed by a narrative. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You guys can read for yourselves. But you see, narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, flip it over. It just keeps going. And this is not something that is artificially imposed on it. This is how Matthew wrote it. Okay? Very well organized, very you know, well structured. And it's done this way to enable the student to memorize the material. Okay, so now here's what I would like for you to do. You notice up on the, uh, on the screen there, I have filled in for you um, uh, how you um, uh, organize the material in narrative number one, the beginnings of the gospel. So if you read narrative number one, chapter one to chapter four, verse 23, there are eight sections. There's the genealogy, then he talks about the birth, he talks about the Magi, the escape to Egypt, the massacre and the return. Uh, then he talks about John the Baptist, chapter three, Jesus in the desert, tempted, and then he goes uh, to Galilee and he's beginning to select disciples, okay? These are the headings. You know when I say read and just list the headings? I've done the first one for you, okay? Again, you can sit in the class and just get the information, it's fine. If you want to take this on as a Bible study, great, then go home and do this. You know, uh, I know you've got plenty of time, but you can do it if, you, if you'd like. So what you'll do is, like for next week, read ahead, read you know, Discourse, chapter five, so on and so forth. Get the bullets, you know, put, the, uh, put you know, the, uh, the, the sections down, write the sections. And then next week, or next class, I will then do, I'll do narrative one. So I'll be behind you. I'll do narrative one next week, okay? And you will have done discourse. Then the following week, I'll do the discourse and you jump ahead and you do narrative two and so on and so forth. So you're always one ahead of me. The idea is, instead of me giving you something to study after I've taught the class, you get to study ahead of time, and then when I do the class, you compare what you've learned to what I'm giving you. Okay? So that's the outline. That's the word I've been looking for here for the last five minutes. You do the outlining, and then I also want you to note nuggets. Nuggets. And a nugget is, I have just learned something that I never knew before. Not because I learned it in class, but because I learned it on my own. As I read Matthew and as I was going through it, I just realized something that I never saw before. And I just, you know, I note it. So if you're wondering, people tell me I ought to be studying my Bible, yeah, but I don't know how to study my Bible. Well, that's how you study your Bible. You can't study the Bible without a pencil and a piece of paper uh, or a tablet or something. You, know. you can't study the Bible without writing stuff down. Okay. So I'm giving you a way to study Matthew. All right, hopefully, those of you who like to continue studying, you'll be able to study whatever, whatever book that you like to study, you want to tackle. The way that we're going to do it here in Matthew will equip you to study any other book in the Bible. Okay, that's the, that's the purpose behind it. All right, that's it. Thank you for your attention.